Welcome to the Sidewalk Weekly Podcast, a show for people who are big on cities but short on time. I'm Vanessa Quirk. Eric, we were off last week. You were on vacation. What did you do? You know, I spent most of my time trying to come up with a joke for the podcast. <laughs> okay, I'm so excited to hear the fruits of your labor here. Let's go. Well, well I didn't come up with anything. Okay. I, I, I think it means I need a longer vacation, but <laughs> I hear you moved last week. You actually did travel, unlike me, whose vacation was at home. I did. I left the uh, rolling hills of West Virginia, and I'm now surrounded by the rolling hills of North Carolina. But you're in a city now. I am outside Asheville. Yes, beautiful Asheville. So you're you're now eligible again to, to co-host the Urban Podcast. I'm, I've been welcomed back into the fold. I hope the urbanist fold. We, we are we are glad to have you back, Thank and, you. and we are glad to have you back, city lovers. This is the Sidewalk Weekly. I'm Eric Jaffe. We have a bit of a special episode this week. We're going to look at one top urban tech story, but then we're going to go into an extended interview with urban economist Richard Florida on the future of cities after COVID-19. Nice, new format. I like the uh, the experimentation we're going for here. Let's get into it. Okay, our first and, and this week only story comes from Nina Jankowitz, who's writing at The Atlantic, and she's talking about how the country of Estonia has had a relatively smooth time weathering COVID-19 because so much of its daily business and its daily conduct was already done online. Uh, Vanessa, you visited Estonia, this beacon of digital democracy last year. Mm -hmm. How did it get to this point? Yeah, so uh, for those who aren't familiar with Estonia, it's a former Soviet territory. It's a fairly small country. It has 1.3 million people. But when it broke off from Russia, it decided that, you know, if it was really going to set itself up for long-term economic success, it needed to really plan ahead. And so it decided to kind of throw itself headfirst into becoming a a super digital, super tech forward Mm. society. And today they're bearing the fruits of that preparation and that planning because now pretty much everything that you can even imagine doing, it can be done online. You can vote online. You can make a bank deposit, obviously. You can apply for government assistance online. You can file for sick leave online. You can get medical care all through the same portal. So when I was there, they would say to me, you know, you only need to show up in person to buy a house, get married, or get divorced. Everything else you can do online. I hope you didn't do any of those, actually, when you you were there. (laughs) Yeah, I, I remember, you know, we studied Estonia a little bit when we were drafting our proposal for Toronto, and I was struck by there was kind of one particular statistic that has always stayed with me, which is that, you know, in, in many places, it takes several weeks to start a business in many cities just to get through all the bureaucracy and, and the forms and all that. In Estonia, it takes an average of 18 minutes right. because it's all done online and it's all ready to go. So, you know, in, in the amount of time it takes to listen to our podcast, you could start a business in Estonia. Right. Which is, you know, arguably a far more productive use of your 18 minutes than this podcast. <laughs> Arguably. You know, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> but anyway, so the, the point is that now when the pandemic hit Estonia, you know, Estonians were basically able to avoid a lot of the logistical challenges that we have felt here in the U.S. and that in other yeah. countries have felt, right? So think about the challenges that of people going to vote in, in the primary in Milwaukee last month, right? Yeah, right? That was a really difficult process that could have been circumvented if we did have a secure online voting system. There's also, you know, the delays that occurred with people getting their stimulus money from the government, right? Um, from the Paycheck Protection Program for small businesses, too. You know, people missed rent payments of this. That was real financial pain that in Estonia they didn't have to think about because everyone's kind of already set up on this online system. And and how it works in Estonia is that, you know, everyone gets a, a really secure digital ID. The government has a once only rule essentially. So what what they say to Estonians is, you know, you are only ever going to have to input information into the system once, one time. That way, every time you go to do something different, it can kind of pull in the information for using the secure digital ID that you have, right? And it'll validate your identity. So whenever you plug it in, you get this unique pin code and you're on your way and everything's like safe. So it becomes this really seamless experience. Exactly. And and again, what I recall, uh, I don't think this was in the piece, but it's also 
from my understanding, super transparent mm, for yes. you as a user, right? You can log in to the system. You can see exactly which agency or which entity has been looking at any of your information or accessing it. And you actually have control over who gets to access that information, right? You get to give permissions to, to whatever entities you trust. Right. And so, you know, it, cr it creates this general culture of, of responsible data use that I think gives people trust and confidence in the system, something we, we don't really have a ton of here in the U.S. at least. And you get a lot of really valuable innovations that emerge from that and a lot of really valuable kind of processes as we're seeing now mid-COVID. I think, you know, one thing Nina Jankowitz brings up, which was really interesting, is that cities uh, in Estonia are starting to get into the mix here. They're holding public meetings online. They're holding public consultations online. We've seen Similar progress on that type of thing in, in cities like Barcelona has a really impressive digital democracy platform called Decidim, which means I think we decide mm -hmm. in Catalan. You tell me. I, guess. I think you're, so. You're the expert on that. <laughs> I'm not the expert in Catalan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> makes it, you know, it just makes it super easy for people to, to give their feedback on public proposals, to play a more active role in shaping their city. These are the types of systems we need to move towards. Yeah. And I mean, Nina Jankowitz just does conclude that unfortunately in the U.S. we are really far away from having this kind of system that Estonia mm -hmm. has. You know, Estonia has been building this digital infrastructure for decades now right yeah um that said you know there have been baby steps moving towards two u.s senators did recently introduce a proposal to at least allow the senate to vote remotely during times of crisis like this and and nina jankowitz like her her take on that is like you know that, that's a temporary patchwork solution it's not really reimagining not a reimagining that we that we really need i think we could really use estonia as as a beacon here for for the u.s moving forward that's what it takes a reimagining yeah Okay, that is it for all of our top stories this week. Yeah, all of our one. As always, you can find the links to the stories in the podcast episode notes. In our next segment, we are going to talk with renowned urbanist Richard Florida about the future of cities. Back in a sec. We are now joined by urban economist Richard Florida. So many of our listeners will know him, but for those who don't, Richard is a University of Toronto professor and the author of many celebrated books on urban growth. He's also a Sidewalk Labs advisor. And given all that's happening in cities right now, we wanted him to join the Sidewalk Weekly to talk about what things might look like in the future. So Rich, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. We talked a couple months ago at the very beginning of this pandemic, and you were pretty optimistic about the future of cities. I'm wondering, as we sit here a couple months later, cities are starting to open up. Do you still feel that same optimism? Well, I, I'm more optimistic, not less. And, and I think the takes have gotten more dystopian. Everyone from New York with means has left. So that, that's the general take. And then there's usually a map which shows that, in fact, a small percentage <laughs> <laughs> of New Yorkers left. That's the place there was really the only and biggest urban exodus in the United States. You know, I'm in Toronto. If there's been an exodus, it's been fractional, right? People didn't even go up to their cottages until, until the weather got warm, until late May. So I think that what the crisis is, is doing is accelerating a bunch of moves that were going to be made anyway. And we're, we're reading into that because what people do in crises is they get really scared really fast. They think the worst. And then for some reason, they're impelled to write that down as a, they're going to have a record of what they predicted. New York will die during 2001. New York will die during the financial crisis. New York will die during this and the other thing. And of course, every time they're wrong. In general, I become more optimistic the longer this has gone on. And But on the other side, or there's all these utopian takes. <laughs> you know, the cities are going to become magically green, magically healthy. There's going to be no cars. There's going to be no air pollution. There's going to be bike lanes. Everyone's going to look like Copenhagen. <laughs> and the reality of this stuff is that the cities will look pretty much the way they did. And I think, I think here will be the difference. They'll be slightly younger. For sure, they'll be slightly younger. They will have, in the near term, a lot less demand for office space and a lot less demand for street level retail. That'll be a challenge. There will be more bike lanes and less people using transit, but there'll also be a lot more people in cars, which is gonna be a pain in the neck. Um, but they're gonna be something like we see today with a few subtle changes. And, and then over the next couple of years, they'll come back completely. But but no, I, I'm very optimistic that, uh, about the future of cities. So, so the end of density claims, though, overblown. Density is one factor. 
but when I worry about density, I don't worry about density of cities. I worry about two things, fear of transit and fear of elevators. I mean, that's what's, it's not like, oh, I'm scared to go to New York City. It's, do I get in the train? Do I take transit? Do I get in an elevator? Managing transit is, and trains is going to be a big deal. And there are ways to do that. And then how do you manage if you're in a big office tower, a big residential tower, the use of the elevator? Because that, that I think those are the things that, the, the elements of density that we make a person fearful on a day-to-day basis. It sounds like you feel like big coastal cities are gonna come back. But I do think that there could be an opportunity for smaller cities to lure a lot of folks who are you know, facing the pressures of really high rent. So could you talk a little bit more about the opportunities for smaller cities right now? So I, I think bigger cities will be ever more for the very young and the very ambitious and the super successful. Hmm. But that the ability of families or the fear of families of being in cities that will increase. So you're going to see this, you know, this barbell, which we've all, this is not nothing new in the United States where people come to the cities to build their careers, embark on, on their lives, take advantage of a thick labor market, develop personal networks and connections that move them through their career, to meet their partners and spouses and friends. And then they have kids and go, oh shit, it's really expensive here and I can't get a lot of space and it's tough to navigate. I've got to move. So I do think for, for smaller metros, there is an opportunity that they're part of a new choice set, not for career formation and the first move out of college, you know, especially for highly ambitious, highly talented people, but for the family formation move. Yeah. You know, I've been writing about this for 30 years. For the first time in my life, I'm hearing people, I'm checking out different metros. So yeah, I think for those places, there's an opportunity to attract talent. It's funny. I think most of those places have thrown money and incentives at companies, which is exactly the wrong approach for them. The right approach for them would be, hey, you can work remotely. You're priced out of these big metros. You can have a fantastic life here. That's what Tulsa's done, you know? And, yeah. and I work a little bit with the Kaiser Family Foundation. They have developed a program called Tulsa Remote, which actually appeals to people on this basis. You can have an affordable house. We'll make you part of a community. You can have a cool workspace, great restaurants. They've really caught up on amenities. You know, 20 years ago, if you went to New York or San Francisco or London, the amenity bundle was just really different at every level. It was just better. You know, and I remember living in Pittsburgh when the first Starbucks opened and people went crazy. You know, now when you go to any one of these smaller cities, the independent coffee shops are better. There, are, There's this whole slew of great independent restaurants and food trucks. There's great little independently owned boutique hotels. Everything seems locally sourced and locally crafted. And you go, wow, I wish I could find this in the big city because where everything is more of a chain. I do think there's a real opportunity for those smaller places to attract people in the family formation here, for sure. So as we think about those big cities, though, and the challenges they might have toward being more inclusive, it's certainly a challenge that we think about a lot at Sidewalk Labs. You've thought about it a lot. It was the subject of your last book. How do we make more progress in terms of getting these really big cities to focus on and actually move the needle on affordability and inclusion? What excites me about the Sidewalk Labs project is it's run by urbanists, not by technologists, right? It's people like Dan Dokhtarov, who I knew way before he was involved at Sidewalk Labs. People like yourself and your colleagues who come from an urbanistic background and are saying we can use these technologies, not in the traditional smart city way to just you know, hang sensors on places, but to build livable, inclusive and more affordable. And now I think you know where, where the technology comes in healthier and safer and more resilient cities. I think one of the things the crisis does for big cities is it does make them more affordable by default. Now this won't be forever. Right. It happened a little bit in 2008 and then it recoiled because people streamed the cities. But I do think it creates some breathing room. I think a lot of pressure is gonna be taken off the real estate market because people in the family formation years are gonna move out. I think older people are gonna move out because they're gonna feel more vulnerable. Uh, I think office space that, you know, there's going to be a glut of office towers that might have to be converted to residential real estate. And I think there's going to be re- retail that's over capacity. 
we may have a lot of excess housing. And so one of the things I would hope is that our cities become more affordable for young people and then for artists and musicians and creatives. But I don't think that'll last forever. I think we've got maybe a two-year window where cities are going to get a little breathing room. But I think that's affordable housing for kind of working middle-class people. I think the bigger issue is going to be how do you provide, as we've seen with this pandemic, cities are not only home to the very wealthy, they're home to the very disadvantaged. And those were the people who were super hard hit by the pandemic in New York. And so hopefully it opens up public policymakers, mayors, leaders' eyes, stakeholders' eyes, business community eyes to say, this is a point of vulnerability, this horrific economic division. It's not just morally and, and economically unfair. It's, it's from a healthcare perspective, a disaster for all of us. So we have to finally go about as we recover, building more inclusive, more affordable and more resilient communities. And by the way, that's not just on the housing supply end, that's on the demand end. That means getting people more incomes, especially those frontline workers, uh, making sure they have more money in their hands to, to survive, to buy houses and participate you know, in the housing market. You had said previously that the inclusion discussion was the hardest to jumpstart of, of any of the conversations you've ever had to try to have with cities. And so it sounds like you're saying now you think there might be a window to have that conversation in a more productive manner. I think it is a hard conversation to have. I think that cities have jumped at the ability to attract big companies, sometimes grotesquely, like in the case of the Amazon HQ2, where they offered far too many incentives. I think that cities have jumped on, you know, we're going to attract all these rich people from foreign countries and suburbs and build luxury towers. There's only a very limited market for that. Now, I'm not sure we've been cured of that. I hope we've been cured of that. But I still think cities have to realize that at their core, they're, you know, what Jane Jacobs called these collections of diverse bundles of peoples and diverse bundles of neighborhoods. And that's what makes them great. Something we think about a lot at Sidewalk Labs is the role of urban innovations. How could urban innovations kind of help cities work towards the goals of inclusion, of sustainability? Are there any particular urban innovations that you find really promising? And, and how do you feel about the role of urban innovations? I think what surprised me is the backlash out there among so many so-called urbanists and others that were very scared of urban innovation. And so ur all urban innovation is either a sensor that would track them or an invasion on their privacy, when that's not what urban innovation is about. It's about making a safer, a healthier, a more resilient, and maybe a more inclusive city, and doing that in a democratic way where you listen to and reflect all stakeholders. I think the areas that are poised for real advance quickly are online work, online education, and delivery will be three things that really stick around. So the Instacart-like services and even better. Um, I think urban information and analytics, especially with a healthcare, you know, home automation, real estate management, commercial building management for health and safety with sensors and temperature checks and building safety grades, elevator management, that stuff's gonna grow like gangbusters. I think that people are gonna say, once they see the importance of these technologies in making their lives healthier and safer, boy, they're going to say, this can help me and I'm not going to be as resistant to it. I actually think the space is op more open now, even though there'll be some trauma, there's going to be some disruption in the space. The space is more open now for urban innovation than it has been in the past three to five years. Let's talk quickly about Toronto. You've obviously, you live there now and you've, you've lived and worked there for years uh, and you have followed our project on the Keyside Waterfront Development closely. Uh, we have ended that project, of course, but what aspects of that effort do you hope can live on either in Toronto itself or, or even kind of more broadly? Well, I'm really sad, you know, because I love Toronto and, and I want to see Toronto become an innovation leader. And to my mind, this that project was a critical component of that. But stars don't always align. And I think that the point of fact is that Toronto's governance mechanisms weren't quite ready for a project like that. I think that's what it shows more than anything. Toronto does not have the flex, it has a federalism, but does not have the flexible federalism, multi-level cooperation, public-private sector co cooperation, collaboration that we're used to in the United States. And that that's something that I wasn't quite aware of and, and it surprised me. 
Uh, I still very much love Toronto. Toronto still can learn from the project and become a center of urban innovation. Moreover, I'm hoping that Sidewalk Labs learned a lot from the Toronto experience and can take this project to other places. And, you know, maybe it's just not the best fit for a city like Toronto. Maybe it's a better fit for a city like Detroit or Pittsburgh. You know, in Detroit, you have a lot of vacant space, needs, desperately needs care and maintenance to be redeveloped. You have the University of Michigan moving into the center city with the new innovation center, ostensibly devoted to urban innovation. In a place like Pittsburgh, I'm just taking two that I know. My wife's family lives in Detroit. I've lived in Pittsburgh for nearly two decades. You have Carnegie Mellon, you know, one of the three top, in, along with Stanford and MIT engineering anchors, a lot of space on the waterfront and many others. And, and maybe it doesn't have to be one big project, you know. Maybe it could be many smaller seeds of projects that are planted in different communities. Okay, Rich, we have one last question for you, and then we were going to let you go. So what would you say to someone who's been, you know, pretty shaken by this pandemic, especially with all the negative talk around density and the death of cities? You know, what is the uh, positive ray of sunshine that you would give them to make them feel like it's going to be okay? The future of cities is bright. Oh, this too will pass. And it's already, it's already passing. I mean, the anxiety level I feel is completely different. Although I did run a temperature the other day and got freaked out. You know, it was just a simple thing. And I took an antibiotic and went away. But I'll tell you, I got really scared. Yeah. Even though I say that. So look, I think we're going to be fine in another year. This time and next year, I think we're going to be out of, I hope. I mean, I'm not, I don't have a crystal ball, but I think we're going to be back to pretty, pretty close to normal, if not sooner. I'm looking, I'm looking at my, my laptop piled up on a stack of old versions of Rise of the Creative Class that I can't even give away anymore. And I'm thinking about what did I get wrong? I underpredicted the velocity and ferocity of the urban revival. Completely blew it. Like completely underpredicted. After 2008, wrote this whole essay for the Atlantic. Completely underpredicted the mass, you know, the, the power of the urban revival. What I worry about is that this doesn't stop it at all in the long run, that it comes back even stronger and we're ill-prepared and we end up even more divided. One thing I would hope, I think of urban innovation as a broad multidisciplinary effort of technologists and engineers and urbanists, that we have a similar kind of effort or maybe an overlapping effort in public health where medical professionals and public health professionals and urbanists and economists combine forces for a broader definition of what public health is and how we manage this. That's what I think I would really look forward to in the future. Thank you for joining us, Rich. Thank you, Rich. Thank you. It is now time for our final segment, our favorite segment, The Last Smile. This is the segment where we set aside the depressing news of the week and focus on something happy for a minute each. Eric, what made you happy? What made you smile this week? Okay, so I'm back in action this week, and what had me smiling was uh, the story in the Wall Street Journal by Conrad Putzier on the fact that Cleveland is now building the tallest mass timber building in the U.S. Ooh, go Cleveland. This is a really important step forward uh, for a hugely promising technology. Cleveland is going to build a nine-story building. Uh, very exciting. In fact, the only thing I was disappointed in was the name of the building, which is which is just called Intro, hmm. for some reason. Intro to a tall timber future, perhaps? Intro to intro. I mean, like, <laughs> you know, it was about as disappointing as, as my intro joke <laughs> today. So to me, you've got this nine-story building. It's made out of wood. If you're a J.D. Salinger fan, it's just screaming for a name like The Carpenter or Raise High the Roof Beam. And I just feel like, you know, Cleveland didn't quite hit it. Maybe intro is some sort of hometown reference that we are completely over our head. <laughs> the JD. I don't know. Just It's nine stories, right? It's uh, I don't know. It, it had everything except for the name. <laughs> All right. What's got you smiling? So I enjoyed this article by Stephen Levy in Wired called This AI Maestro Wants to Serenade You, all about this composer and cellist named Philip Shepard. And Philip likes to take walks in the woods. And one okay. day in 2016, he kind of had this like, 
a vision, I guess, of what if I went out into the woods and the music started to adapt to my environment, right? Like what if like the sun came out and then like the violins would come out to accompany the sun? So with that beautiful vision, right. Philip is like, you know, what could I make this a reality? He gets together with a guy named Tom Gruber, who was a, a big AI guy at Apple, and they created this company called LifeScore. And so the idea is that they start off with regular musicians composing little elements of music that can be combined or looped and then the ai takes the input from the listener and kind of chooses which elements hmm. and how to shape them it could essentially become this soundtrack that adjusts to your setting and your mood but i just thought it would be such a cool way to not only interact with nature but maybe interact with a city right like imagine each neighborhood kind of having a different soundtrack and then you get this this basically a, an audio accompaniment for the sidewalk ballet of each neighborhood you know <laughs> That's true. And then you walk into Times Square and it goes. Oh, Oh, God. (laughs) No, I think it's like. "Eh, eh, 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 eh." (laughs) That's how I imagine Times Square. (laughs) All right, folks. Time is up. Thank you for joining us this week. If you want to read the stories we discussed today and many more, then you should sign up for the Sidewalk Weekly newsletter. Do that at SidewalkLabs.com. We should note that the views expressed in the Sidewalk Weekly don't necessarily reflect Sidewalk's company position. And if you think that we're missing a perspective, then let us know. Send us an email or a voice memo to podcast at sidewalklabs.com, and we might just talk about it in a future episode. The Sidewalk Weekly is produced by Vanessa and me. Vanessa does the editing. Our music is from Blue Dot Sessions, and our art is by the great Tim Cow. We'll see you next time. Bye.